Hello, I uh, wanted to start with a thank you for those who have attended. It looks like we've got a great audience today and had a handful of fantastic responses as well. So this will be one that will be good to follow. Um, and uh, we encourage you guys to participate with chat, with polling questions and general questions as well. The uh, webinar for today for you guys is managing denials uh, with best practices. The aim, of course, is stopping denials before they end up costing you money. So just for a little bit of recognition who you're actually speaking with, my name is Marcello Gasparini. I'm a workflow specialist here with Advanced MD. I've got about uh, 12 years in the industry uh, and seven of those with uh, Advanced MD directly in, in multiple different roles. I'll uh, do my best today to keep it interesting, keep it fun, as I'm the only one presenting. Um, but uh, let's get started on things. Uh, you know, the topic of denial management is always something that sparks conversation. So we've got a, a pretty healthy sales team here at Advanced MD. Um, and we always know that as we go through and ask about denial management, about AR, claim resubmission, appeals, um, you either get this sigh of, oh my gosh, I don't want to tell you. Um, and on some occasions, you get practices that are really proud of what they are doing. Um, what I always like to bring to the table is kind of what we know. And for those of you that uh, might be new to the idea of Advanced MD, um, I would say this is your status quo. So this is kind of what the average practice looks like according to the MGMA, so Medical Group Management Association. And what they're saying is that the average practice has about 15 to 20% of their claims are rejected. Um, technology is changing that slowly but surely, but we're still not at that you know, single digit rate yet. Uh, this one was staggering as well. The actual average cost to rework a claim is $25. Uh, and then even worse as you go down, 50% um, of denied claims never actually get reworked. So uh, the staggering part that, that puts the real exclamation point on this, if you will, is this is the problem that practices have. Um, I call it the $4,940 problem. And that's on a monthly basis. So these are just kind of some numbers off of what we see with an average practice at Advanced MD. About 400 claims per month for a single provider. Um, and you know reimbursements right in the $150 range on average. If you fall into that category with denials and cost to rework claims and what claims that are denied don't get reworked, this could very easily be what your practice looks like. So with that being said, before we even go into the agenda, I thought it'd be a great time to send out a poll. Um, it's good to have you guys engage and give me your feedback as we do these so we know exactly what you're up against. But the poll question should pop up on your screen. Um, and really what I'm after is uh, what are your approximate percentages of your rejection rates and denial rates? And I always say at this part in time, if you're a, one of the, the billers in your practice or the, the revenue specialist, the doctor will never know what your answer is. We find out on occasion that, that sometimes the billers and the billing team and the revenue cycle management team doesn't always want to be fully transparent with the doctor. Um, so uh, no one's telling anyone here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut the poll down, get your last votes in, and put the results up as well. Okay. Uh, you guys are aligning pretty well with what the industry is doing in general. So about a 15% being our number one answer. Um, golly, well, 22%, gosh. Um, and then right in that range. So between 15 and 20% of those who are on the line um, are in that same spot. So um, that's a big call to action for us at Advanced MD and drives me to uh, what the agenda is for today. All right. The biggest part about creating a denial management plan and having internal best practices um, is putting something together that you can rely on as an entire organization. Now, whether that's a, a one doc practice, you know, or you're a bigger organization with multiple facilities, locations, and providers, uh, it's something that all people can align with. So here's what we'll talk about. Um, what are the employee responsibilities and what's the importance of their role? Um, we're also going to get into what are the elements of a denial management plan. Uh, some best practices that we see from um, Advanced MD super users, uh, and then just a quick sample of, of the effect and what the successful denial management plan can look like. So uh, that being said, you know, 
you definitely want to avoid the Three Stooges, right? It's it's a, that effect that just goes downhill and snowballs. So one of the most important things you can do, and oftentimes we always recommend, this is one of the first things you should do as well, is define what each employee's role is. So uh, to put this on a personal level, uh, it, over here in Utah where Advanced NV headquarters are, uh, my wife and I, we both admit to the fact that we are quote unquote, UT fans. Now, if you don't live in Utah, that typically means the Longhorns. However, if you do live in Utah, that's the University of Utah. What uh, our house is certainly divided for football um, on the home front. However, um, your practice should be divided into a couple of different workflows as well. Let's see what it looks like. Um, first thing you need to do is put together your front end team. So what we've done is taken the best practices from the industry and on your front end team, pretty simple. We've got your staff members that are more likely to be on phones and work on scheduling. Okay, so you've got one or two members of that team. You've got your clinical team that may include your physicians. And then you've got your billers and coders who are looking to basically prep your claims prior to submission. Okay, now the general responsibilities that fall under the, uh, the front office staff are kind of bullet pointed out here. Some of these seem really simple, um, but this is off of the industry recommendations. So you'll see that appointment scheduling, registration, eligibility check, and I would even add actually understanding the eligibility as well. Um, and then going through and looking at check-in and check-out processes, patient payments, uh, referrals, pre-authorizations, coding, and charge capture. So we would say that's what falls under the, the role of the front office um, or the front end, so to speak. Now, on the other side of the house, house you've got your back end processes, okay? So uh, the staff here may be a little bit fewer in number, uh, but what you're really looking at is who's doing the payment entry, right? Who's putting the doctor's charge codes in, or is there a software in place that automates some of that piece? Um, and then who are your collectors, right? And, and really and truly, we call these the money makers because most software systems can easily find the low-hanging fruit. Um, what the general challenges are is having to go through denials and having to go through those other pieces uh, that make this uh, obviously tricky for those reasons, okay? All right, now the common responsibilities um, at the back end, so the back of the house, so to speak, are gonna be your billing edits, uh, resubmissions, uh, patient statements, uh, payment posting, um, looking at the variance analysis, basically how different is your reimbursement uh, in comparable, in comparable to your contract with the payer? Uh, denial posting and resolution, appeals, AR follow-up, and payer trend analysis. So um, it's all hard work, front office, back office. Um, however, there are many steps that go into this that can make this be a, a success or, or for that matter, a failure for your practice. So what we say is um, when you're looking at building this out is really defining your revenue circle, right? You've got the process of claim submission, patient intake, generating revenue from copay, so on and so forth, or cash pay. Um, and then what's the process and who's going to manage it? So when you look at this, we've always used this as a guide that should walk you through, hey, these are the most common steps for having a really effective internal team to manage your billing and obviously have a denial plan in place. Okay, uh, now from here, one of the things that's, that's gonna be important to look at is what are the elements of what goes into a denial management plan? I think that for senior billers and, and senior staff members that have been doing you know, the claim submission office managers for quite some time, um, you guys could probably rattle these off. Uh, you'd be surprised though at how many times we get really tenured employees and, and tenured professionals, so to speak, um, that miss a little bit here and there, and those small steps that are missed end up being big items where they can get through and see real simply where they could collect more revenue or prevent more problems. So everyone likes something for free, whether it's a value or not is, is up to the person consuming it, but we do have a free consultant today. He's got a little bit of notoriety with the key and a kite. He made it to the $100 bill, um, and along with that, what do you know, he's on the cover of Time Magazine. So. Uh, Mr. Franklin himself kind of says it best, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Plenty of people liken that to medical, but we can liken the same thing to your billing process and denial management. So with that being said, here's what we're finding out. 
So 90% of denials are preventable. Okay, so that's a number that came from HIMSS in, in a 2016 survey. So think of those of you that answered to the poll question where you've got a higher rate of denials, 15 to 20% maybe, um, and what it looks like to have a vast majority of your claims without a denial attached to them. So that is what we're going to talk about right now because really prevention is one of the most important parts of what you can do to make sure that your practice is, is effective. Okay, let's break this into a little bit of workflow. So we talked about the front end and the back end. What we're providing today are some elements of how to categorize your front office staff. Okay, so many practices, obviously, um, if you had to hire a person for each one of these steps, you know, the private practice would be in a little bit of trouble simply because that's a lot of labor um, and it would take a lot of time to get these things done. So what we say is let's offload it. Let's take the front end staff and make sure that they're capable of doing these steps. So it starts with your batch eligibility checking um, and then correcting, uh, uh, doing the data entry uh, for correct ID numbers. Now you'd be surprised, but those correct ID numbers, if they're off or wrong, can be one of the top denial reasons that we see in the practice. The other thing about the eligibility is understanding it. It's not just a green button that says they have coverage, but it's great for the practice to know from the front end before a claim is ever submitted if they've maxed out on out-of-pockets or if it's the beginning of a calendar year and they've got dollar amounts that actually will end up being patient responsibilities. That all has an impact on your AR. Um, the other part is looking at timing, um, but when are you going to re-verify the patient's information? Insurance carriers can change as often as a patient might change their jobs. So how frequently are you looking at that to make sure that you've got the right info and what's the workflow process for your front desk and front office to do? Those are your determinations to make, but what ends up happening is you can at least put that task on one of the roles within your office. Last part is your copay collection um, and looking at your patient balances, right? The best time to catch a patient obviously is when they're in your office. So copays are always recommended to be collected there, but patient balances play to AR very heavily. And so in this process, your front desk while they're there can create a payment plan or even address it, there might be an outstanding balance. Now, um, we talked about the clinical staff being on the front end of denial, uh, on the front end or the, of the office and how that plays into denial prevention. Really what we're looking for here is a couple things to make sure that you're covered. First and foremost is your clear medical documentation, right? If you're gonna be billing with or submitting a particular set of procedure codes and diagnosis codes, you need to make sure that for a multitude of reasons that you have the right documentation to support it. Sometimes it's a letter of medical necessity where your exam and, and your, uh, your encounter with the patient uh, supports it. Um, other times it's making sure that you have an overbuild on your E&M coding. Um, and gone too far down the road and pushed a limit where you don't have appropriate documentation. With the clinical staff as well is, is the task of pre-authorizations. Um, in the industry, we laugh about this a lot here in, inside Advanced MD, but within the industry, um, we're certain that insurance companies want to make it hard for you to get pre-authorizations complete. So they force a phone call, they force those lovely hold times, um, they always seem to forget that they did or didn't send it to you. We know that pre-authorization means the form of a reimbursement for you, and insurance companies like to keep their money. Um, we put that on the, on the shoulders of the clinical staff, though, because we need to be able to verify the medical necessity and proper need. Um, so you can keep your staff in touch with the patient's chart, the reason they were referred, and also with the insurance companies to make sure that they've got those letters stored. And then also, so with new procedure verification, what about the, the provider manuals and the payer manuals? So knowing your payers is a big part of preventing um, any denials from coming down your way. Every payer is going to spin it a little bit differently. So, you know, there's a lot of ways of doing that. Uh, I think the old school way is book, right, with a spine and paper pages on it. Some of the newer ways are like using software systems, like what you might be able to find in Advanced MD, where we're managing a lot of your payers and their procedures, diagnosis codes, and modifiers that are actually all allowed to be bundled together and some that aren't. So we'll get into software just towards the tail end of this, but those are some steps that can help automate this. Last part, and this is a big one because these roll over to patient balances, is knowing what's not covered so that you know how to bill for it. 
So the best practices there are obviously what we mentioned a minute or two ago, which is making sure that it is an uncovered procedure. You should know that by the time the patient shows up for the appointment and have the discussion over payment or a payment plan before you've actually rendered service for them. Now, uh, let's go to, on the front end for denial prevention, the role of the billers and the coders. Coding accuracy is a big part of this. And this one I always say kind of plugs in with your people, your staff, right? So, so who is it um, that you've got on staff that is very clear on the coding? And is it easy for them to be able to review what you found in your chart? So I'm sure that, that you know, on the line listening to the webinar today, we've got a handful of people. Some might be on paper, some are electronic, some are advanced MD customers. The idea is how easy is it for your coder to go through, check the note for the appropriate areas, and then be able to either add modifiers or uh, change codes based on their knowledge of it. Great coders will also bring to the table for you guys ways of maximizing revenue on each line item of your claim. And not to talk to it too much, but the way of also helping them is the right software. The other best practice is that charges are entered within 24 to 48 hours. Some practices wait. They take a half day on Friday um, and in doctors submitting to billers and coders. Uh, in today's day and age with technology, uh, they should be entered and submitted almost instantly. It's also a point in time where the providers and clinical staff are going to be more clear on any questions that you might have on the encounter itself, okay? The recommendation for your billing and coding team is to have payer experts. So with Advanced MD, uh, you know, our new clients, we, before starting implementation with them, what we do is we ask them for their top five payers. Uh, the reason for it is the good old 80-20 rule. Usually 20% of the payers are doing 80% of the reimbursements. So with those top five payers, on our end, as we implement new practices, our goal is to make sure that those are done seamlessly with your EDI agreements so that you can submit claims electronically. You should be looking at doing the same thing internally, and not only from an EDI perspective, but knowing the ins and outs of your Blue Crosses, your Aetnas, maybe even your Medicare, if that's a high volume of, of, uh, of patient who have a lot of, of Medicare or Medicaid. So... The part that comes into that as well is making sure, first and foremost, you're not going to run up against any timely filing, but you're also going to learn that those payer experts will know exactly how those claims need to be formatted based on their experience with denials, collections, so on and so forth. And that's kind of the next point there, which is the payer requirements and your contractual guidelines. Okay. So on the front end, uh, you can see where you can put a bucket and maybe even like a dotted line to each of these tasks that can prevent and then assign them to your workflow and to your staff members as well. Now, let's look at how the back end denial prevention works. It's a little bit different on the back end, right? Because it's not so much denial prevention as it is fixing something that may have slipped through the cracks, right? Maybe um, on the coding side, something was off, or maybe you've got a clearinghouse rejection um, where it's kind of uh, taking a, a claim or two out and saying, you need to format this differently for the payer. So, um, with this, it's a little bit less about preventing a denial because that's going to happen on the submission side of things. It's more about being able to see with your teams internally, so your collectors and your charge inter or your payment entry staff, what problems are common. What are we seeing our rejections and denials for all the time? What is the, you know, the, for that lack of a better term, what are the top 10 that we get denied for? And how can I communicate that? so that my team on my front end can be accurate in what they're putting into the system. So my job on the back end is just as easy, uh, so to speak. Um, we've always said to also look at the denials as an opportunity to be proactive. I always look at it almost like a football game, right? If you can get an idea of or, or a copy of or a thought process around what the other team's playbook is, then you have a one-up. Right. So in the world of medical of medical submitting claims, if you know why a claim might get denied, then fix it before you send it, because that has a big impact on your AR. I mean, the days for reimbursement from a clean claim compared to one that is actually um, coded improperly, you might have an error. You're looking anywhere from 10 days for a reimbursement if it's done right or 30 days for your AR to wait if it's done wrong. OK, also be a part of educating your staff on how to identify trends. Like what should they be looking for? 
so that again, it's more done as a team, right? This is your internal revenue cycle management team, all right? And the ultimate goal for all of it is getting down to thinking about the root. What can I do to fix the problem? If I can stay ahead of the problem, then I'm in a great spot because I don't have to worry as much about denials, appeals, so on and so forth. So on the back end staff, these are the, the dotted lines that should go over towards you. So we have a pretty good idea of what it looks like to be in that role and who's going to take on those particular tasks. Okay. Now, um, what I want to do is move over a little bit to a, a best practices. Um, and before going down that road, what we'll do is just another polling question. So let's, uh, let me just go from one slide to the next. So on this one, um, for, uh, before we go knees deep into it, I'd love to get an idea from those who are on um, kind of the categories of what your denials, rejections and whatnot, what do they look like? Um, are they payer based? You know, are they based on maybe some data entry errors? Is it a coding issue? Um, or do you have a hard time determining it? Okay, we'll wrap up the poll now and let's see what we got on the results here. So the dual category. So leading the way by a long shot uh, is basically duplicate claims or coding errors. This one doesn't surprise me actually. A lot of practices these days put the biller in a dual role where the biller is being asked to do coding as well. Um, and if the biller has that experience, fantastic. They're worth their weight in gold. Um, however, there are times when they don't. And so you come up with coding errors that are simple, simple fixes prior to claim submission. Um, and then duplicate claims, uh, from my perspective, is moreover, do you have a way of tracking the first claim? Uh, the interesting part about this is the next closest bucket was about your payer information, right, at 20%. So um, we'll address each of these as we go through and give some best practices on what Advanced MD does and what we recommend for you to have a successful denial management plan based on the practices we deal with. I thought this was kind of a, a cool slide to show as well. So if Advanced MD was a, was a practice um, instead of a business, uh, we would, we'd be a very large practice with roughly 35,000 providers. Um, I think our claim submission on a monthly basis right now is getting closer to the billions of dollars that is going through. So we ran an internal report to look at, well, what are just the general reasons that claims get denied for advanced MD users? And here's the list. So invalid, invalid subscriber, which was one of the leading ones. Duplicate claim, which was again uh, a leading one from the poll. Uh, time limit, so timely filing uh, happens. That's that value of knowing the payer. And then services not covered by the payer, which is gonna push that balance to the patient for cash. Uh, credentialing uh, or provider enrollment, and then also the coding problem. So it sounds like you guys aren't far off of what people are seeing with an advanced MD uh, at the same time. Um, let's get into a, a bit of a breakdown. So. This is the benchmark, okay? This is the best practice that you guys should be striving for with your denial management plan, okay? Ideal denial rate for any office should be at 5% or less. Now, you know, outside of going into a sales pitch, so to speak, on Advanced MD, that's one of our guarantees. So people that are using our software have that as a written guarantee and access to reports for that. This is the standard that we hold ourselves to. Everybody can tell you from a software perspective, they do better, they only have 2% of denials, so on and so forth. But if they can't show you the reports um, and show you how to track it, it might just be a sales guy trying to earn your business. So let's go into more of what this looks like. We talked about the payer experts, okay? This is huge for us. So when you go back, I'm gonna go back just a couple slides, but when you look at an invalid subscriber ID and you look at the credentialing or the provider enrollment on here, and also the time limit for the claim submission, if it's expired, um, and services. Those are all payer relationships, okay? So knowing your top payers so you can avoid the number one reasons that people are getting denials is a big part of making sure that you're not chasing revenue. We'd rather have it flow into you than you guys have to go through it. So put your payer guides in your practice. This is probably one of the newer ones um, from what we didn't talk about and also connect with a representative from the company. 
you're doing a good volume with them. You're doing good business with them. It's how they stay in business as well as from you as much as they make it hard for you. But you've got contracts with them, utilize it. They will have people for you to connect to that are direct connections instead of 1-800 numbers, okay? Um, that's a part of their job. Let's go into another set of steps. Um, this one is also um, a process that for office managers and billing managers alike, uh, and even doctors, regularly review your denial data. Now, what we see is a lot of times getting this data is a real big trick, right? It doesn't always come together. Um, and it's not always readily available with a click of a button, right? Uh, reporting is a big part that goes behind all of this, but define your criteria. What is it that's the, you know, what we'd say is a KPI, your key performance indicator within the walls of your practice. So here are the ones that when we work with practices uh, are really what shout out at us real quick and easy. So what percentage of denials do you have from the first time you're trying to submit a claim? The idea with these reports is that you can then pin the problem to a particular department, front end or back end, and then look at who's in that role and train them um, and sometimes make decisions that maybe you're not the best person for that role as well. Um, next thing we talked about, top 10 reasons that claims are denied, okay? Generate your reports and your data that will show you the denial with a breakdown by payer, location, specialty, and provider. We know that lovely POS, the place of service, right? That will change your reimbursement. If it's done at an ambulatory surgery center, hospital, clinic, mobile, whatever it may be, if that's not properly put in there, you're getting different reimbursements and potential rejections that are gonna come your way as well. Can you see what denied claims have actually been reworked? That number at the beginning, 50% of denied claims do not get reworked, right? So. That's a big question of how is your practice doing? The MGMA obviously is a reputable organization. So how do you plug in and are you really losing that much revenue? Can you pull the report on it? This one, the staff time and costs. This is the one of your staff and your labor it is typically your highest expense within a practice. I mean, I guess I should say arguably. But with that, can you track how much time your staff members are spending on things and are they productive? It might be an indicator that you need to hire more staff or might be an indicator that your staff isn't productive and they need to be trained or you might have the wrong staff, okay? Uh, your time between, denial and appeal, right? How long is that sitting for? You will hit timely filing if you're not jumping on it quickly, right? And then of the claims you've received, how much of your, that, are, that have been denied, how much of a reimbursement have you gotten on them? Were they done properly? Um, and then last part, what are your dollars from write-offs? We all know that goes into taxes and quarterlies and whatnot, but this is the data that as an entire team, right, your internal team here, front office, back office, practice owners, doctors, should all be looking at on a consistent basis to monitor to see if it jumps, moves, if you've got improvements, inconsistencies, so on and so forth, okay? Now, when we talk about payers, the numbers here, most payers require a dispute to be resolved within 30 to 60 days. They are not going to give you time. We know that, that's the game they play. So on appeals, you know, have to know one thing, they take time. But you can automate some of these processes, right? And with that, you can at least track how far out you are so you can prioritize what appeals to work on based on the date of that filing or the rejection or the denial, okay? So with that, Automate, uh, that's a big part uh, of what Advanced MD does when we come into practices, but using us or not, we need to look at what can I do that will save me time because I'm working against the clock. So first thing, create templates for the common denial reasons. Run that top 10 report. Create the template that makes it a one-two step so it's easy to do, everyone can follow it, and use an EHR to generate the information and put it in one place. There's a lot of conversation that, you know, started from some time ago with meaningful use and carries on through MIPS and MACRA right now about if you should be using an electronic health record. Look, whether you like it or not, there's great data in there and that data can make parts of your job easier. So, you know, commentary aside, you can use that as a way for you to be able to get things done quicker, okay? Establish um, what information is being pulled. If you've got appeals that are coming from a hospital level, what info do you need from them? Get it in advance. You know, almost expect that you might have the denial. Have the information needed handy so that you're not waiting 
okay? And then always after you have resubmitted for the appeal, follow up in 30 days. Now, there's a piece of this as well that, that's gonna be the bow that goes around the box and we've talked about it a little bit already. But what it really comes down to is, can you generate the reports you need for this to work? The other area, so to speak, of lost revenue, it's not just a denial because of a coding reason, but sometimes you're posting payments that look like you're getting a reimbursement, and you are, but you're not getting a maximized reimbursement. So can you look at the variances to see, hey, I contracted for X amount of dollars for this reimbursement, and I'm only getting paid 90 or to 95% of that. That's absolutely a conversation that you need to be having with your payers, right? You contracted, their job is to wiggle, and their job is to make sure that they're protecting their money. Um, so if you don't push, you won't get it. Um, and the last part is, how do you hold them responsible, right? It's, it's business to them. And the more that you let them get away with shying off of even $5 from a reimbursement, then the more they think that you're not tracking your revenue. And, you know, it's a collective they, but it is a game when it comes down to it. So in that appeals process, make sure you have a plan in place, right? And what I would say with this at the same time is going into it and saying those relationships you have with your direct contacts at the payers, this is what you speak with them about. And I would meet quarterly, if not even more frequently, um, if you're having problems on your reimbursement matching your allowable from your fee schedule, okay? All right, I wanna show you what a successful denial, plan man, man, <laughs> denial management plan might look like. It's just a brief example. Uh, but before doing that, I think I've got one last polling question for the attendees who are on. Um, and let me make sure I've got the verbiage on this right. So give me a second to read it to you. If you are gonna select a single tool, you know, after our discussions today, after your industry knowledge of exactly, you know, what your practice looks like, if you're gonna pick a single tool that would help you create a more successful denial management plan, uh, from the list here, it's a select one for today, pick the one that would be the most important to you, um, that would have the biggest impact on your practice, so to speak. We'll give it another 10 or 15 seconds or so. All right, let's uh, wrap up polling in three, two, one. And let's take a look at results now. Um, again, not one I'm surprised by. So um, denial management tracking. This is a obviously a big piece of it. So for Advanced MD, we call it an AR control center. And for us, it does look at what you can do to see just denied claims versus some that are partially reimbursed. Um, the, the one after that is a more educated staff. Um, and then almost in last place, but uh, robust reporting. So I'm gonna come back to that one. Um, and, and I like the, uh, the 3% of folks that said this is too complex, <laughs> time to outsource. So uh, denial tracking is a very big piece of this. And to me, that's more of a tool that you need. Right, so um, for those of you that have been billing and doing you know, revenue cycle management for some time now, technology has come a long way with this. Um, you shouldn't be on Excel sheets, you shouldn't be on EOBs downloaded from the, from the clearinghouse and balancing off of those. Um, you should be in a system that does all that for you. That's one of those automate steps that we talk about, okay? Um, now, let's go into um, what a successful denial management plan uh, might look like for you. So let me just get the screen back up here. Okay, so you're seeing on this that one of the most important things, identifying your top denials. So in the far left column there is kind of how this reads. We've got three examples. So um, my number one top denial reason in my fictitious practice today is that the patient's ineligible. Number two is that the claim lacks adjudication information. You don't have a complete uh, claim form or your coding's wrong. Um, and number three, you don't have the referring provider or pre-authorization listed. So these are gonna be similar types of reasons that you experience denials in your practice. When you have a denial management plan, you have the next two steps laid out so that if you've got a high volume of claims denied that are patient ineligible, you can look at a prevention step, 
which is identifying the trends. And then you can look at a step further of saying, well, that's something for eligibility check and eligibility understanding that in my denial management plan, we've decided that's the front office, right? And some practices put eligibility checking on the back office. So make it yours and make it work for you, um, but have a place where it can go. So you can have a conversation to a specific person instead of saying to all staff members, we have to do better at this, right? Give it a task and draw accountability to it. So as you read across from left to right, if you're lacking claims adjudication, great. What are the common trends it's missing and who does it land on? So now I'm going to have a conversation with my back end about coding, right? And last piece is if there's no pre-authorization, um, that might be your clinical staff as we categorized them for today. Um, but who did it? So who missed that the referral info was not was or was not sent to the payer or who needs to send it sometimes as well? Um, and then on this piece right after is, that's where we need to direct our conversation so that we can have a very well-oiled machine, okay? So with all of that, that's essentially uh, the grunt of the webinar for today. Now, what I wanna do is open up some time for questions. Um, and as you guys are kind of uh, going to the question area of the, the dashboard you should have on your end, I'll let those flow in for a few, but also, uh, it's always good to make uh, a note and, and a little plug for what the role is of Advanced MD. And maybe if you're not an Advanced MD customer or a client of ours, this is the same question you should be asking of your software provider, okay? So look at it two different ways. One is that what can the software do, okay? So can the software automate an eligibility check? Can the software bring in the details of an eligibility check? Does the software have the ability to click a button and open up, for example, um, denial tracking and an AR module? So at Advanced MD, one of the things that we do well and it's unique to us in the industry is uh, we bring rhythm to your practice, right? Rhythm is the idea of your clinical, your practice management, and your patient engagement tools all in one place. One login, one company to call for support, one database, okay? That is the software side that we provide, okay? On the flip side, there's a service side of it as well. One of the polling questions was, this is too complex, I'm not doing this, right? So we would never leave a practice stranded, right? We understand, we've had practices that have had their billing in-house for years, and the biller quits, retires, whatever it may be, and they need a solution. So you have the ability to also look at the services that Advanced MD offers. We have our own revenue cycle management department, and we also use our software to service roughly 600 different billing service companies across the US. So you have a lot of options that don't always require you to change software if in fact you know, you're using Advanced MD and needing to make a change. Okay, I'm gonna go into questions, and let's see what I've got here. I've got a couple. Give me just a minute to read these, so appreciate your patience here. Okay, first question comes from Dennis, if I'm reading it right. It says, uh, can Advanced MD supply the eligibility details with respect to copay and deductible information? Uh, great question. So the answer is yes, we can. The caveat is, this is still something that is depending on the payer. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? The big dog in the industry. Um, yes, we pull in what their eligibility details are that will tell you copay, out of pocket, so on and so forth. Sometimes smaller payers, all we get is a copay. And the insurance company in the eligibility check that we make, and it is automatic, it won't bring back in what the actual out of pocket is. So it will vary. We can handle it. We want all the insurance companies to be able to work with us on it. From time to time, they won't, okay? So great question, Dennis. Um, another question here, and I think we can maybe wrap it up, is um, uh, based off of one of the poll questions, someone asked, uh, looks like it was David from Florida, what is my opinion on the best tool, the best single tool? Um, and that one, you'll get some, some mixed bag on it, but uh, the way I would say it is it's your reporting. Um, you can have some of the best staff in town. You can have, you know, great processes, great patients, great, great providers. Uh, if you don't have a tool um, either in your software or a process that you can go to to find out what the problems are, 
then you don't know how to drive the ship. You don't know what way to go, north, south, east, or west. What you know is you're just chasing revenue. So I'm big on reporting. Um, I've always brought that up in conversations. And in so many circumstances, what I've also found out is that uh, practices think that they've got the reporting they need. Um, and when you go through and get it granular, you can find more and create productivity, or uh, you can go in and actually look at some areas where you're missing things. Um, that was a little bit of a quicker one. I wanted to answer one other one because I think it's great. That's a good question. So this is from Robert in Texas, and then we'll wrap up for the day. Uh, the question is, uh, where do I start, right? Where do I implement first, and what's the first step? Okay, so I just was on the soapbox with reporting. I would say, number one, identify your problems. You know, that will let you know if your staff is going to be the right staff for it. If they're capable of fixing it, you need to hire new, different, or move some people around. Um, for sake of saying, all right, let's say we've got reporting in place and let's say we've got staff in place. Uh, this is a big bite of an elephant. And so as they always say, it's one bite at a time. Um, so what I would be doing is looking next at what does your software do, right? Can you automate steps? Can you have better integrations with clearinghouses, payers, with EHR, with hospitals, with providers? What can you do to get all of the data so that when you run your reports, it's a click of a button and you can easily see the information that's going to tell you where you're doing well and where you might be coming up short. All right. So it's a good blend of reporting naturally, people, and then the right tools, right? It's the right software. You don't want to go cut down a tree with a hatchet. You'd rather use a chainsaw if you can. So that being said, I wanted to thank everybody for joining today. This has been a good, big success for Advanced MD. This will be posted within 24 to 48 hours so that you can come back to it and review it. Probably should have let you guys know that before fact, but hey, if you write things down, your ability to remember them actually increases by about 32%. So um, to all who are on the call, thank you so much. We will talk again. Um, the next webinar is next week and it is on HIPAA compliance. And please don't forget to look at Evo 18 out in Salt Lake City, which is our users conference, coming up in about three weeks. Thanks so much. Have a nice day.